close to it. It was a heuristic. And, um, and then I tried to optimize. And, uh, and it was that optimization, that minor little tweak, because I didn't like the position of a bar on the screen that apparently just, just ruined the whole thing. So uh, fortunately, we do have a black marker. So I'm hoping that the whiteboard will be OK. But uh, I'll try to have something a little bit more digitally friendly for the future. I think I just need to cycle the system, and I've already wasted enough time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so where are we? So if you uh, look on Canvas, there are now um, two uh, different types of a homework assignment. So I've got a homework 1A, which is a concept check. Um, and it is a uh, just a little uh, two auto-graded questions and two essay questions where I don't ask you for more than like a sentence on one and two or three sentences on the other that will be hopefully after this uh, this lecture, you'll have a sort of enough background info to answer. And then, um, oh, I meant to also record this. And then homework, and I think I've got this set, uh, the due dates are online. Um, I think I give you a week for this one, but double check that online. But then there's homework 1B, which is labeled <coughs> as a practice. And it is a small exercise in implementing a genetic algorithm from scratch in two different ways and comparing the two. Uh, so um, it, the implementations for each of these are probably just a couple lines of code. Uh, and you're, you're optimizing a relatively simple function. It's just a scalar valued scalar function. But it, uh, it just shows you how different encodings and different operators work inside these genetic algorithms and gives you an opportunity to play with those. So those are online. If you go to either the assignments section on Canvas or the module section, you should be able to find those. All right, so where were we? So last, uh, so basically trying to make things more formal is that we have this context where we are um, you know, in sort of an optimization framework here. And we're trying to minimize uh, or maximize. So minimize some, and I'm just going to call it abstractly a function, uh, where this, uh, if we're to maximize, then that's the same thing as just minimizing the negative of a function. And this function for now is a scalar uh, value. So it's a scalar function. Uh, as we move on, we'll talk about multi-objective optimization where the function actually produces uh, vectors as sort of an output. And then how, what do we do with that? What does it mean to even minimize in that case? But for now, we're just minimizing a function whose arguments are vector valued and potentially very large. And so um, this, this x here comes from, let's say, the reals where n could be very large. But we also have constraints. So we'll say such that um, we also need this x to be within some subset x of this large Rn. And this could be a very complicated constraint space. And so it uh, may just be a box, it may be a cube, some sort of, uh, or it, it, it may be this kind of non-separable constraints. And uh, that ends up being making this more of a difficult uh, problem. So, but if we think about this f, we can say, you know, where um, f may be, um, let's say, costly to compute. Um, it may have many local optima uh, and singularities and saddle points. Uh, and uh, it may be, you know, I already said it's a function of many variables. So it's, uh, you know, then, um, you know, x uh, has high dimension. And so once we start working in this space, it becomes difficult for us to use the kind of standard methods for doing uh, optimization. So some applications here, let's say that f 
need not be a mathematical function. It could be a simulation, a high fidelity simulation model of a physical process. F could be a simulation of a jet engine, for example. It maybe takes a week to run one replication of the simulation. Or um, uh, you know, it could be um, a, an oven uh, in a, some sort of fabrication facility. Uh, and you know, if you set up the parameters, you might need to know how well that oven runs over a long period of time and integrate over that. And so it just takes a long amount of time. You, don't, you can't really very quickly take different samples of F. F could be a mathematical expression without a single closed form. F could be some complicated, let's say you're, you're doing some you know, Bayesian optimization or something like that, and you're trying to calculate a posterior distribution, and F might be uh, some really complicated integral. And so how do you deal with taking an integral of something that, um, that may itself have a lot of kind of complicated parts? And uh, so, so that's another kind of example here. F could be a real physical system. This could actually be something, optimization, where you've got hardware in the loop where you actually uh, you know, send something out. So there's a guy coming here uh, and giving a talk, I don't know, two weeks or so from now, maybe next month, uh, named Lee Cronin. Um, he uh, is at, uh, in Glasgow, and he's a chemist, but he's taken 3D printers and basically retrofit them to be chemical reactors so that he can evolve inorganic uh, reactions in the loop to have certain properties. So he would like sort of a chemical combination to chase itself around like a swarm, or he would like certain patterns to be formed, but he doesn't know what reactions to put in, and so he ends up having the computer run the, the, the experiment, evaluate the experiment, and then rerun it over and over again. Question? Can we go to that talk? Uh, yeah, I, I can send the announcement out for that talk. It'll probably be way over in biodesign, I think, but, uh, but yeah, that's, so, um, and then F could be a neural network. And so a neural network, you know, sounds nice and simple, you know, everybody uses them, but if you really think about them, they, they are complicated beasts in themselves. They can have many neurons, uh, many connections. And we'll talk more about a neural network and where it comes from later in the semester. But for those of you that are already familiar with that, you know that you can't just start with, uh, with a fully connected neural network and hope that it, it works. You have to train it. And uh, that training, it requires effectively an optimization. You have to sort of say, what's the best way that I can adjust these weights to achieve a particular relationship? Now, most of these problems I've talked about sound pretty continuous, but it also could be discrete. So you might have um, you know, certain uh, sources and certain uh, sinks and uh, a network of, um, of different stops and different ways to get from one spot to the other. And you need to figure out what's the best path, and best in you know, some way that's determined by this optimization objective. And this becomes a discrete problem. So which edges do I take? That's a combinatorial optimization, and that also can apply here. And so if this becomes a very, very large network, then this combinatorial optimization problem explodes, and it may not be well suited for some of the more mathematically favoring, uh, favored uh, methods for solving it. So our goal is to build an algorithm that can search over the domain of F and end up coming up with a solution that we hope is pretty good, in other words, pretty close to the optimum uh, location, uh, the optimizer of F. And so how do we do that, and how do we make this algorithm itself not just do a brute force search? Because in a continuous space, it's impossible to truly do a brute force search. And even in a discrete space, if there's a lot of, um, let's say, different edges here, when you think about all the different combinations of edges, then it would be impossible to do a brute force search, at least for um, even, even problems that seem small, but uh, certainly problems that actually get very realistic, then you just can't search through every possible path through the network. So that's kind of the context that we're living in here. So that's where these meta heuristics come into play. So that's where we're living, at least for a while, purely in this optimization. That's a major part of this course until we switch over to some other things. So are there any questions about this context of what I mean by optimization of these really hard problems for which we can't make a lot of mathematical assumptions? Or even if we can make mathematical assumptions, even evaluating the, pro the, the uh, function might be so costly that we can only do a couple of different function evaluations. All right, great, okay. So um, now, of the kind of families of optimization algorithms here, there 
what, what's a, if you're doing optimization, what's something that you really hope you have access to other than just the optimization function? What's a, a useful tool that generally helps most optimization algorithms, especially the mathematical ones? What was that? The derivative, right? So the gradient, right? So that would be a great thing, is that if we had the gradient, then maybe we could make use of that. And so um, if the gradient's available, then we have a bunch of methods, like Newton's method, for example, that is kind of relates to something that maybe you, you know, you, you worked at in, you know, in high school when you're sort of trying to understand why the, the derivative is zero at a, at a minimum. So you know, if you have the gradient, then maybe you can use something like Newton's method to get started. <coughs> or newton Raphson, or whatever your, your kind of variant of that is. Uh, now, the problem with this is it's only gonna find local optimizers. And so, even when you have the gradient, very often what you might do is you do a coarse grain search with these meta heuristics we're talking about, and then once you come up with a heuristic that you kind of think is close to the optimizer, then you can unleash a gradient-based method, and then hopefully it will then uh, do the fine grain search in that little neighborhood. So these are largely kind of you know, neighborhoods. They're not really great for finding neighborhoods, but if you're in a neighborhood, they're good for finding the optimal point within that neighborhood. So if you don't have the gradient, so if you, uh, you were saying no gradient here, then we do um, a variety of what we call direct search methods. So direct search just means that you don't have any other information. All you can do is evaluate the optimization objective F. And you evaluate it multiple times, and that gives you a gradually you build a map of the optimization objective, and hopefully that gives you information about where to go in your next step. So there are a bunch of non-nature inspired direct search methods. One of the kind of most popular ones you see in the textbooks is gonna be taboo search or TS. And so taboo search is, um, it is a local search method, meaning that it starts off in one location and it searches the neighborhood of that location. And where it gets its name is that it, uh, wherever it starts, so let's say it starts uh, in this, let's say you've got X1, X2, and X3, and uh, it starts at some uh, x uh, naught uh, in the middle here, and then it takes steps around that position. And even if, uh, if all of the steps around it that it takes are not actually doing better than it did before, so basically Taboo Search um, asks the question, how, how are we doing in our current spot? So if we start at x naught, let's evaluate this, and then let's take a little step away from x naught to go to maybe um, uh, x, you know, so now I've got x1 and x1 back here. Hopefully this isn't, you know, the mix of notation is not too confusing, but then, uh, then the idea would be, well, how, how much better or worse do we get here? Now, in taboo search, you allow it some probability of moving to a location that's not as good as the location you were in, and that gives you some exploration ability but you greatly penalize moving to a spot that you've been to before. And that's where it gets the name taboo. All the places you've been before become taboo. They become kind of you know, these third rails that you'd rather, rather not step on. And, um, and so these search algorithms gradually move around, marking spots as visited or not visited. Sometimes you have to go to spots you visited to before to maybe visit spots you haven't but it gradually sort of does a local search, visiting around you um, in new locations and then uh, maybe then moving away. But it, it's, it's a very, it's a trajectory-based method, um, starting in one spot and hopefully finding something. And so that was one of like the earliest meta heuristics uh, for doing these direct searches when you have no gradient information available. So um, then we've got kind of the focus of this class, which are these nature-inspired methods. And these also are direct search. You generally, um, they do not directly involve the gradient, but like I said, you can hybridize these things. And so our nature-inspired methods <coughs> 
there are myriad numbers of them. Um, and so we've talked, you know, we will talk a little bit more today, or quite a bit more about the genetic algorithm. There's also ant colony optimization uh, is another popular one. Uh, the genetic algorithm is pretty general. Um, ant colony optimization, or ACO, at least in its purest form, is a discrete optimizer. And so ACO is when you're doing those pathfinding problems. Now there are continuous versions. Uh, Giorgios Finecos, uh, back when he was doing his grad work, actually developed a more continuous version of ACO to work on some of his continuous time or hybrid systems work. So that's an example, even kind of locally here. Um, and, um, and then a whole bunch more. Uh, but so we're mainly gonna start focusing on like the GA but, uh, but we'll gradually see more as we go on. I'm only mentioning the ACO because uh, those people who've heard of the ACO, you might not realize that it's at least the purest ACO is a, is a discrete optimizer. It's for those like pathfinding problems or combinatorial optimization, whereas the GA is much more generic. So um, of these nature-inspired methods, um, and generally of these direct search methods, we basically have um, a grid of uh, you've got trajectory-based methods, you've got, um, and these are your uh, local search it methods, and then you've got population-based methods, and then of those, you can further divide that into ones that have memory, or do not use memory. And so this kind of is a taxonomy of, uh, I would say, direct search <coughs> meta heuristics. And so these trajectory-based methods, that's like taboo search, population-based methods, that'll be like the GA. And um, so there are uh, you know, taboo search methods that can make use of memory versus others that are kind of more Markovian, and they uh, may not keep track of where they've gone, except for maybe the, you know, the taboo search implies you've gotta have some memory of where you've been before. Um, you could have uh, genetic algorithms here that basically just depend on only the current population of optimizers, or they can maybe, you can, uh, you can add a little bit of things in there where maybe they have a memory of where they've been and maybe that changes the shape of the new populations and so on, kind of blending kind of a GA and a taboo search. I'm not gonna fill in these sort of four boxes, but generally when you talk about direct search meta heuristics, this is how people break them down. Um, is it trajectory based? In other words, is it local search? Or is it doing a bunch of searches in parallel, population based? And then, do you have memory or not? And that's kind of the title of you. Yeah, question. What is meant by memory over here? Yeah, so is the search kind of a, like a, just a Markov process where you base it off of um, where, where you currently are in the optimization space? Or are you keeping track of where you've been and then making new decisions based on where you've been? And so you can imagine there are a lot of algorithmic consequences, a lot of performance consequences of this. How, do, how much memory do I have to keep around? What am I going to keep in my memory uh, to prevent myself from going back to that? So when you're configuring taboo search, you have to go back and you have to say, how many steps am I going to go back? Uh, you know, what, what is my memory of what is taboo? At what point does something not become taboo anymore? And so you can, of course, there's trade-offs here. So if you give a lot more memory, then maybe you'll speed up your search because you won't keep revisiting the same places over and over again. But now you've got to have a lot more memory. Why do you usually evaluate Good point. It's the dynamics of taboo search. The fact that you make small <laughs> local movements may mean that in order for you to get to a spot over there, it may require you to take a trajectory that moves through this part of the optimization space. And because our constraint set, this like, you know, script X that I was writing up here, that
that constraint set may uh, have bottlenecks in it. And so taboo search doesn't allow you to have these like adaptive, well, I mean, I guess you could build a taboo search that does, but it generally doesn't have these adaptive step sizes. It just looks in a local uh, the neighborhood. So it's not like you can just jump to another spot there. It may have to go through locations that's been there before. Oh, right, so I mean, you may, when I say revisit that point, you're not gonna like re-evaluate, you're right, not gonna pay that cost again. But, uh, but it's the question of, are you going to revisit that space? Of, you know, are you gonna, if you were at X1, are you gonna go back to X0 and then take the next step and go somewhere else? Yes. What, what, what do you mean by that? Right, so well, so taboo is like approximate mechanism that's driving this. So we're saying that, uh, that we're saying, well, what are, the, what are the rules in which, what are the rules for how you decide which carpet tile to stand on right now to evaluate? And the rules that we are saying is that if I look at a bunch of carpet tiles, um, I might move randomly to one of them, but I'm not, uh, you know, going to go to one that I've visited before. And so we're just saying that the mechanism is that it's as if this tile that I visited before is taboo. I don't want to step there. Um, whether we're not saying it's taboo, we're not saying, you know, saying that it's qualitatively bad to go back there. It might actually be good because if I go here, that may give me access to this spot, and this is actually where the optimum point is. But the mechanism is driven by as if uh, you had a um, I don't know, a, a spiritual system as if the, you, you, the, the, or if the algorithm itself had its, was guiding its directions by not doing things that it's done before. And so that's where it gets the name taboo search. It's not that this is a good thing to do, it's just what it does. The only way we can evaluate if taboo search is any good is just by running it on a bunch of test functions and seeing if it's good. And it may be, this might be a terrible um, you know, thing to do, but it turns out that taboo search has been very successful, and so it's, it's been used, at least in the past, as a benchmark for a lot of other meta searches. Yeah. So how does taboo search block the memory? For, well, so, so taboo search sort of necessarily has memory, and that's how you keep things taboo. Yeah. yeah, so. So what would, uh, what would be an example of taboo to make? Uh, like a local uh, search with no memory? Yeah. Um, so just a random walk would be an example of that. Uh, you know, so that would be like a null hypothesis where you could say, um, I'm just gonna randomly walk and, um, and maybe all I, I mean, by no memory, this might be kind of an extreme here, but it might be like, um, in all of these, I do remember the, the best point that I've ever visited, but maybe I don't have a trajectory of all these other ones in here. So if I just do a Brownian walk over all possible X's, I might luckily get to the optimizer, but that probably is not a very good performance. But you know, so just you know, knowing to kind of go, you can dive deep into all of these different sections here, and uh, you know, so my prep is for this kind of you know nature based. And the other one that we'll talk about as a good comparison is essay or simulated annealing, and um, and we'll get into that in more detail later. But uh, I just want to point it out that these these nature based ones are always biology based. Simulated annealing has some interesting features and in that it sort of starts out doing global searches and then it refines itself and it's kind of based on the process of, um, of cooling. So what goes on in the, the molecular states of a material as it cools? And it, as it cools at slow rates or at fast rates and things like that. And so there's a physical process here being mimicked. Just like here, this is almost a, I don't know, a normative process being mimicked. Here is a physical process being mimicked, and then what we'll start talking about today are these biological processes being mimicked. Uh, just ways to inspire our creativity for moving through search uh, spaces. So, wait, I just want to sum up what you said. It's a taboo search. We revisit points, but then we do not re-evaluate points which are taboo. Well, if you have enough memory, then you may you won't have to reevaluate those points because you'll have them in memory. If they're not in memory, you may have to reevaluate them. But the, what guides your movement around the domain is have, do you remember visiting those points in your recent history? And if you do, then you, you generally don't move there or you move there with very, very low probability. So, yeah, so we basically do not revisit them, uh, except for like, we have to 
go to a point which uh, for which I have to cross the revisit point, like I have to pass through that, then we do that. Well, there's that, and well, so the, the thing is that these taboo search uh, algorithms use stochastics, and you sort of weight a probability of your step. And so you, they might all have, um, you know, if there's six steps around you, there's a one six probability, but if it's taboo, um, then uh, maybe I, I greatly decrease that probability and increase the rest. So, but I just bring up taboo search to kind of a benchmark, to say that there are a lot of other metaheuristics out there, uh, but um, these nature-inspired were meant to provide alternative way directions here. And so we're, um, so all of these, regardless of what metaheuristic you're using, these direct search methods look, have a basic algorithmic structure, a flow chart, that they all will fit into. And if you keep this in mind, then when you start, like I'll get, I made the mistake, and don't do this in your career, of reviewing for maybe a journal that was a little lower caliber than it could have been, but I thought the title of the paper sounded good, and maybe this paper could have gone to a different journal, but I thought, you know, you know, I'd, I'd give it a shot, and I value, and I, and I reviewed this paper. Now I'm on this editorial staff's list, and I get, um, you know, tons of these terrible papers, and it's not a good journal. And but um, <coughs> a bunch of the, the the papers that go to these journals are people's. They're cooking up new nature-inspired metaheuristics. And if you put them into the flow chart that I'm about to put in here, and you kind of further drill down into that flow chart, then you start seeing that most of these metaheuristics, although they have crazy names like chaotic catfish, PSO, and stuff like that, <laughs> that um, that they really like there, there's an a, a easy isomorphism, a mapping of them into, say, a genetic algorithm. So with a little bit of a change in words, you find out that actually someone's already done this, but they weren't necessarily inspired by the same phenomena you were, so they use slightly different you know, words and you know, semantics, but, uh, but in the end, the actual algorithm as it's written down, if you got rid of all of the English baggage, would be identical to things that are already in the literature. So all of these algorithms generally take some initial guess, and then they run that into their, you know, their F function. So it's going to be a simulation model, for example, um, or it might be, you know, evaluating your F, or it might be a real physical system. And that, uh, you know, that tells us what the uh, the value of this optimization objective is. So that gives us an output for which we can measure, you know, we, there's some output metric that we can use to sort of say, is that, uh, at least on an absolute scale, how good is that? And then that gets run into the optimization algorithm, whose sole purpose um, is to choose the next point or set of points to evaluate. So this is an iterative process where the optimization algorithm is just, uh, it's like a one-shot sort of thing where it takes the output, it may have memory of the previous outputs, and then it uses that to generate um, the next thing to evaluate. But before it does that, um, it also asks the question, um, have we meet, met a termination condition? And if we have, then we give the result out. And then otherwise, we take whatever the next one we picked was, and we reevaluate the real system, and we do this over and over again. Now, the termination conditions are usually either based on a computation budget. And what I mean by that is maybe it is the maximum number of times around this loop. Uh, or just the maximum number of times you can evaluate this. So in a population-based optimizer where you've got, you know, maybe 10 uh, of, you know, members of the population running around this every time, then every, you know, cycle through this loop, you evaluate the function 10 times. So you might only have a computation budget for 100 evaluations. Uh, or um, it's based on some sort of convergence. And so it might be that the point that as, that as this keeps going, eventually the last, say, five tries 
all were within some tolerance of each other. And so it just doesn't seem like you're getting a lot of bang for your buck anymore, so you halt. And so they all kind of fit into this. And this is your general kind of direct search meta heuristic. Um, an evolutionary algorithm um, adds to this in that uh, the, what makes it an evolutionary algorithm is the fact that it's using a population. It's not, has nothing to do with genetics or anything like that. It's just that it's using a population. What we mean by a population is that instead of thinking of this as one point, so you can say then this becomes for an evolutionary algorithm, this becomes initial guesses, and then they're all evaluated in parallel. Those go into an optimization algorithm, which um, then changes the representation of those guesses. You can think of these as like each guess is kind of like a local search, like a little taboo search. Um, and they're all running in parallel, and you're kind of deciding which ones are you going to let continue and which ones are you going to kill and then reinitialize somewhere else. And so you're changing the frequency of the representation in the population. And that's what we mean by evolution. When biologists say evolution, what they mean is how are the frequency of certain, in their case, alleles in a population changing over time. If they are changing over time, then something is evolving. So an evolutionary algorithm is population-based because the frequency of solutions, how many solutions are around this location, how many solutions are around this location, are changing over time. So. Um, this is a reshaping process of the population. Now, we will use this term fitness with most every uh, evolutionary algorithm, even if it's not genetic. And fitness, this term, is basically the number of offspring uh, produced by any candidate in the previous generation. So you can imagine you started with 10 members here, and based on what the optimization value uh, of each of those 10 came out, some of them are going to reproduce more than others. And so some of them will only have one offspring, but the others might have 50. If at this point here, we reduce the population size back down to 10, <coughs> then the parents and the offspring that have the most representation are going to be most likely to be represented in that reduced population here. And then that's going to iterate. So the fitness <laughs> is kind of how much the population grows in the case of for each individual member. And then relative fitness is basically how much did one Members, one member's offspring grow relative to another, and the relative fitness is what's going to effectively get rid of some solutions and amplify others. So fitness is an absolute term in population genetics in these population studies, which, but just knowing how fit something is doesn't actually tell you how things are going to evolve over time. Everyone can be equally fit, which means that um, if, I, uh, if I'm a solution that produces 10 offspring, but so does every other solution, when you then randomly select 10, you're most likely to have a similar distribution coming out through here. Now, there's a caveat to that that we'll get into that's very important, but that's the basic concept I'm trying to get out here. So fitness is what causes this to grow, and where some grow more than others. And then relative fitness is what causes things to shrink, um, where some uh, might be amplified and some might uh, totally disappear. So um, in this case, you might have these ones stick around, but these ones disappear. So those are just terms that we'll use as we talk about these. And these don't have to be genetic. Anything that's population-based, you'll find these terms being used, fitness, relative fitness. So basic questions about the basic idea here, before we get into the details of the GA. Yeah? So the reason that fitness causes your potential candidates to grow is that fitness is the overall population increase? So if the overall population is increasing, then how does that generate more candidates? 
Uh, so the so the, if, if you were to build, so I'm kind of glossing over details of specific algorithms, but you could imagine a kind of prototype algorithm that has two phases, a growth phase and a shrinking phase. And in the growth phase, you decide how much does each individual grow? How much more reputation does it get? And that is not a relative thing. That is just purely based on how well you did, how many offspring do you get in the next generation? And they might all get the same amount of offspring in the next generation, in which case the average fitness would be the growth of the whole population. Um, but then there's a shrinking phase where then you randomly resample from the growth population in order to bring it back in to the finite population. And then that is what actually changes the representation. Uh, there was a question in the back. Yeah. Um, I, I guess when I've seen fitness before, it's, it's been in terms of like a fitness function, like how you plug a chromosome into a fitness function. Right. And it'll give me like, like, like some sort of metric. And right. I, I don't really understand it as like the number of individuals or the number of offspring you get for a candidate. Right. And so we're going to get into genotype, phenotype, and fitness here in a second. But, uh, but basically, the, the, even in that particular case, when you have a fitness function, we usually use the optimization objectives as our virtual fitness functions. And so a fitness function, what it is actually representing when a biologist says fitness, is how many copies of that allele will get into the next generation. So that's why when we're talking about a fitness function, so if you have some, you know, uh, I don't know, some trait that, so this is getting ahead, getting ahead of ourselves, but you have this fitness function where somehow some genotype produces uh, is this fit and some other genotype is, um, is this fit, they both actually have an equal number of fitness, which means that um, compared to genotypes over here, this, um, though you'll have, why well, you'll have more of these produced in the next, next population. So then if you have a limiting step, so there's just mortality in the population, then you'll end up getting more representation here. But the fitness function is supposed to represent how much you would grow if you sat at a particular point? How much? How many offspring you would be rewarded? And then, growth and fitness taken after population's already been set, so you just count the means like once you've left over. So that's a good question. Relative fitness is something we use to analyze this post hoc. There is no relative fitness that's actually implemented in the algorithm. Um, well, it, we, I'll show you selection methods where you can say that it actually is being implemented in the algorithm, but conceptually, what I want you to think about is that it's the fitness and the resampling that's doing the magic. If you have growth and resampling, you will automatically implement a relative fitness operator. You don't have to actually say, you're that much better than you. There's no direct comparisons that need to be made because the magic happens in the fact that some members of the population get more representation than others, so then when you resample, those members are more likely to carry on. Yes? Yeah, so when you would say like, um, when everyone has the same kind of fitness and they produce some like same offspring, mm -hmm. can we randomly fit someone from the optimal growth? So that's just a phase. So does it go through convergence or it goes again? Um, well, I, I, what do you mean by does it go to convergence? I mean, since there is, there is no um, change, I mean, difference between every offspring. Ah, yes, right. So if everyone has the same fitness, uh -huh. then the population is what, this the term we use called fixed. So the term fixation or fixed means that every individual is the same. And so if we were to rerun this over and over again, we would have no change and the evolution would stop. And so hopefully our algorithm through convergence or I mean eventually it hit its budget would stop from there. Um, we need to make sure when we design these algorithms that, our, that this algorithm doesn't fix too soon. And that's something we'll get into here in a second because just if you start with a really small population, you can just by random chance accidentally subsample and get the same members out even though they don't really deserve to be 100% of the population. And then that will end up taking away all of your diversity and then you just, your search stops. I think I saw another question. Is there a question back there? Yes. So is resampling the main trick? Like what algorithm you use behind resampling the main trick in this? Yes, and so the different genetic algorithms, uh, well, we'll find that there is a so-called selection operator that is like a pluggable module that you can plug into a genetic algorithm. And it implements 
this step differently. Um, but, uh, th and there is one of them we're called ranking selection, which operate much like this conceptual model, where you basically rank everyone, and then you give them a number of offspring relative to their rank, and then you randomly resample from that. Now, you could say that that, that seems like inefficient if in the end, probabilistically, <coughs> I could just sort of, um, you know, I can kind of jump that and kind of figure out like, oh, I'm just gonna, uh, I know I'm gonna have 10 individuals here, so I'm gonna choose the population of those individuals based on some distribution. And there is another type of selection which does do that, which kind of jumps this. But it's trying to emulate, the kind of biological process that these are emulating is a process of growth, and then due to limited resources, uh, shrinking or mortality. Is that what you're yeah. uh, On what basis uh, do we get the population? It should be a greater amount so we can resample according to our needs? Or <laughs> Are you saying like how do we choose the number of initial population or what do you uh, mean, on what basis? Yeah. So uh, yeah. let's say we had uh, initial 10 and uh, we shrink down them to seven or six, but uh, let's say we actually had more number uh, initially, so we have more options when we are shrinking them down. In most genetic algorithms, you, the, the number of members actually cycling around this loop is an invariant. And so you start with uh, you know, 10 here, and you're gonna end with 10 here. And so there's, uh, this doesn't vary. You could that certainly create alternative genetic algorithms that, um, that, that based in, you can imagine reasons why you might wanna do this, that grow the population and allow it to be bigger and then limit it at later times. But in the simplest and most of the kind of prototype genetic algorithms, there's always 10. And so it might be you keep around some really, really bad solutions to sell out the rest of these 10, but hopefully they'll get selected out and eventually just be copies of really good solutions. Yeah? Uh, more than uh, picking bad solutions, this point around up into the risk of losing out on good solutions. So yep. let's say we started with 10, mm -hmm. and there was thought we did at least 100. And uh, let's say the 100 ones were actually 38 different ones. Let's say we had 38 different ones. Uh, the total size was 100, but there were 30 different Right. If we reduce them back to 10, we've actually lost 20 different samples that were generated during that cycle. Right, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, we'll get into that, but that's, that is one of the problems with small populations, is that there's always a risk that you might have a really a good solution that deserves to be carried around, but due to random resampling, it just doesn't get carried, uh, carried through. And there are a number of ways in which we mitigate those issues. Um, one of them is this, and I'll talk about it, but it's a, a called elitism. So if you've got a really good solution, you just make sure that it is going to be in the next uh, generation. Yeah. But the parameter to measure elitism is that plugin that you were talking about that we optimized. Yeah, right, right. That would be one of the parameters, the kind of hyperparameters. So, you know, so I, I might use this term hyperparameter. What I'm kind of saying here is that the, the algorithm is trying to optimize the parameters of an optimization of a function, but then the hyperparameters is the parameters of the genetic algorithm. And yes, those are one of your degrees of freedom to play with. All right, so let's move on. I think some of these questions will get answered as we kind of go through here. Um, the other thing I do want to call your attention to is this, uh, again, this constraint set um, where it's you know a, a strict, it could be a subset of Rn. Uh, now, this constraint set could be a really weird shaped thing. And it's maybe difficult, like you might start with 10 things that are feasible, meaning they're in X. But when you wanna choose the next ones, you need to choose members of X. But calculating inclusion in X can itself be a complicated computational problem. You know, so you might draw a point that is outside of X, but then you've gotta project it back onto X to find the closest point in X to the point that you, draw, you drew. And that can be really, that can be another optimization problem. <laughs> It's minimal distance. And so there are a bunch of different options there. Um, you know, you can just throw those away and just keep trying new ones until you get lucky enough, but that's also computationally costly. Sometimes if it's feasible, if it's not feasible in the, the true sense, but sort of softer feasible, if it's, if it's reasonable to do, you can actually say, even though I'm not gonna consider that as a real solution, it turns out my optimization objective is defined there and so I'll leave it in because maybe 
it having it available at the boundary will actually be useful because it gives me information about the curvature of the optimization function near the boundary. So you might leave that in. So um, I'm not going to go into these in great details, but I just want to say this is another area where you can have a lot of freedom to choose how are you going to deal with making sure that the solutions that come out of here are, um, are within <coughs> this set. How do you make sure that things are feasible when you suggest <coughs> new solutions? A question in the back? Um, I had a question regarding that business algebra that X writes. Um, if, we, if our algorithm right now finds a solution, for example, like a PSP <coughs> yeah. right? and Traveling salesman. Yeah, traveling salesman. And you have, for example, um, 100,000 nodes, right? Yeah. Now, for us to actually find the real solution, is like computationally not possible because mm -hmm. of the size of the nodes. But now, if this algorithm ever converges, how we can how can we ever know if we found the correct optimization? Right. Especially for problems which are in NP hard or in That's true. And and that's kind of the whole the whole reason we that we have these heuristics, you know, and and, and these meta heuristics. We never know, uh, but we just hope and usually we we have so in the case of the GA and then we'll talk about this a little bit later in the semester the most the purest form of the GA when it was built that was built to be simple enough that you could actually run you could actually do a little bit of mathematical proof on the GA and actually make a statement about the solutions that came out of the GA relative to the functions that we're, we're operating on but they had to keep that GA very very simple to make it analytically tractable most of the optimization algorithms that you see implemented in software tools do not have that tractability. And so you're kind of taking it on faith that they're gonna give you a good solution, which is why you might run pilot studies, you might try a couple of different optimizers, see how long each one of them takes to produce a point, compare their answers. But you know, in the end, yeah, you may not have a lot of confidence that you've reached the point. But it's kind of like uh, you know, all models are wrong, but some are useful. As long as you do better than the state of the art, we're making progress. There might be some other enterprising graduate student that comes up with something later that for your function, they say, look, we found this tiny little case that's so much better. And, uh, and that's great, great for them. But they're not here yet, you're here. <laughs> so if you can find something better than the last grad student, then you're, you're making progress. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, feasibility, important thing to keep in mind. All right, so a um, few more definitional things. So this, these evolutionary methods are just population-based me based methods. But then when you think about you know, what are, what's a process that gives me insight in how the populations change, hopefully for the better, then the thought is, well, maybe genetics and population genetics, maybe we should drill down into these a little bit more and see if we can mimic at least some of these processes. And so um, and when we talk about living systems, there are a number of terms that have now been inherited by the GAs. And so I'm going to talk about these in terms of living systems, just so we know what the context is. So in, uh, you know, this is sort of your biology, living systems. Then we have, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, DNA is an informational molecule, and so I'm not going to focus on the central dogma and RNA and those sorts of things. Nowadays, that some of you are involved in bioinformatics, then this stuff, um, you know, you have a lot more familiarity to these concepts. Back when these things were being built, it was much, much simpler than that. And so, uh, so we're we're not thinking about uh, transcription or translation. We're not thinking about any of the omics stuff. This is just a very, very basic model of how living systems you know, can be viewed. And so at, at the root of these things, now you might say there are other informational carriers in living systems. There's you know, other informational molecules inside a cell other than DNA, but we're just gonna focus on DNA as a string of letters that are put together um, in chromosomes. And so you can just think of these as long strings of letters put together. And so these, uh, these chromosomes are strings of, and I'm going to use this term, genes. Now to me, gene 
is actually a location. It is not uh, a particular set of letters. It is a place where letters could go. So we can think of these genes as regions of the chromosome. Now, in those regions, you actually then have something instantiated. You've got, it's like this is your formal argument in the algorithm, and then, you know, actually down within the algorithm, you actually have to put something there, and those are the alleles. And so an allele are basically the different options, and you can think of these as strings of letters. for a gene. And so I say biologists, when they say the term evolution, they define evolution. Now notice that I'm not talking about natural selection, because that's evolution by natural selection. There could be other ways to have evolution. Evolution generally means the change in the frequency of alleles in a population. So I might have an allele for something like whether my ear is dangly or connected, and you might have the other allele, and we could go over the entire population and ask how many people have um, the dangly or connected part of their ears. And, um, and actually, another simple one, because um, uh, you know, a lot of people use eye color, but eye color is kind of complicated. But another simple one is straight is whether your earwax is sticky or matte. And, uh, and so you can ask uh, how many people have sticky earwax and how many people have kind of a, wa a matte earwax. And that frequency distribution is at one particular generation. And if you watch how that frequency distribution changes over time, that's studying evolution, studying the, the, how the changes in frequencies over time. And so the collection of alleles for one particular um, individual is its genotype. And that's an individual's alleles. And so I have a genotype, you have a genotype. If you go off to 23andMe, they'll be able to find out what your genotype <laughs> is, and they may or may not tell you what your genotype is, but that's what they're doing, is they're, you're getting the string of letters that makes up your uh, DNA. Now, once we have this genotype, there is a function that maps. So I'm gonna call the function P for no good reason, it's just my convention here, that takes the genotype for an individual and it also takes the environment around the individual. And out of this function, it maps these two, the Cartesian product of these two, um, into what I'm going to call the phenotype. And this is often called, um, is being expressed. So a genotype is expressed as a phenotype. And it's important, in this, um, you know, some biology we call, um, this used to be called the genotype to phenotype mapping. As we got more realistic over years, it became, um, so that we used to be called the, 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 the G to P mapping. Well, this is called the G by E to P mapping. And the environment's important there because let's just say you have, say, the gene for um, a particular skin color or a particular eye color. And that eye color or skin color can only be expressed if you have a certain pigment, but that pigment is not available in the environment. You will not express that color. Having the gene for that color is not enough to actually express that color. So it may be great. So a lot of birds you know, are, are very vibrantly colored because it seems to be, or at least the best explanation that we have so far, is that they are showing off to potential mates that they were able to secure the, um, the aspects of the environment that allow them to produce that color. That is at least in some cases. In other cases, it has to do with um, handicap principles and things like that. But this environment component is an important part here in this mapping. So there isn't a simple genotype to phenotype environment. If you move a genotype into a different environment, you get a different phenotype. So, uh, but, so we have all these. now. The other complication here is whereas the genotype, there's one genotype that you have, unless you're a chimera or something like that, but for the simplicity, you have a genotype. But um, your genotype, um, the phenotype is actually 
uh, expressed with variation. So this is a stochastic map here. And so uh, you, or another way to view it is your phenotype, uh, if you're talking about a cellular case, your phenotype might be parameters of this distribution. But if we talk about like eye color, then I might, you know, I, you and I might both have the genotype that corresponds to brown eyes. But your brown is a little different color than mine, even though we might eat the exact same thing. So there is still some, some variation here. And so that variation, in part, comes from the environment. So this is um, a ver effectively a random variable, making this a random variable. But also, there are other aspects of this I'm leaving out that are other parameters of this mapping that are also random variables. As an example, those of you, uh, you know, studying bioinformatics, you know that you've got genes uh, that end up getting a DNA, gets um, translated, gets transcribed into RNA, then gets translated into proteins. There are a number of different chemical reactants that are needed in order to make that happen, and there's a finite number of them in the cells. So one cell might be able to express something, one other cell might run out of it. These small copy number variations are examples where you're going to get differences in phenotype just due to those differences there. So there's lots of different stochasticity here. And the GA people kind of just threw all that out. They said, you know, we're just going to imagine that there's, for one genotype, there's one phenotype. Now why do I mention, you've got multiple genotypes mapping to one phenotype. The phenotype is important because this is actually where fitness comes out. And so there's another function that I'll call, let's say, F. And it maps your phenotype to, um, is proportional to, so I'm just going to say equal, but if you'd like, you can think proportional to um, the number of um, offspring for that individual. So there might be, it might be that blue individuals get a lot of offspring. There might be multiple ways to code a blue individual. So you can have multiple genotypes, but they all have the same phenotype, which means they'll all have the same fitness. And so in a GA, we gloss over all of this mapping, and we basically compose this F function with this P function. And so in a GA, a genetic algorithm, we have a sort of an F function, which is just um, F of genotype um, equals fitness. And this, again, fitness is this number of offspring for a given individual. So um, I want to close here today with a little map that gets us to this term drift, or at least I hope we'll get this to this term drift, and then we'll pick up there next time with the implementation details of how this all maps into computer code and makes for a halfway decent optimization algorithm, at least for many different optimization objectives. So basically, there's a map, or there's a, a path here from your genotype <coughs> to your phenotype, um, and then that goes to fitness, and then there is a limitation from, say, resources in the environment, which will change the frequencies. So I'll say delta frequency. And this change in frequency is this evolution. So this makes for an evolutionary algorithm. This here makes for a genetic algorithm, which is a subset of evolutionary algorithms. And, um, and what I want to point out here, and this has already kind of been brought up, is that if everyone has the same fitness, you can still have changes in frequency here. So you might have a diverse genotype, set of genotypes, which produce maybe a diverse phenotype, maybe not. But if you happen to produce the same fitness across all these genotypes, because this limitation process is random, then you might have started out with an equal distribution of all of your genotypes. 
and everybody grows, but then they would get resampled, and somebody just by chance is going to get an edge. So they started out, and everybody had five individuals with the same genotype. Those five individuals all doubled, so everybody's got 10 individuals with the same genotype. Maybe there's three genotypes, everybody's got 10 individuals. Then if you then pair everybody back down, so there's only, um, so you're back down to the original 15, then now somebody might have six individuals. Some genotype might have six individuals, another genotype might have four. So even though they all have the same fitness, the next time around, that difference is gonna get amplified and amplified and amplified until eventually you get that term fixation. And that fixation is when you have one genotype cycling around this. And that is an example of how you can have evolution without any sort of functional selection. And this path to fixation is unavoidable. You can build a little Markov process that models this, and you can show that there is an absorbing state you don't know which absorbing state will be it, but there are absorbing states that represent fixation for each of the genotypes that you put in there, and you're gonna hit one of them. And so this process of the getting less and less diversity over time is what biologists call drift, or genetic drift, or allelic drift. And so drift is evolution toward fixation without any selective pressure. And we have to design our algorithms so that we minimize the effects of drift. Because the bad thing that can happen is that even if you do have fitness differences, once your fitness differences get sufficiently small, they can get dwarfed by the force of drift. So there's constantly a stress between drift and selection, drift and natural selection. Yeah. So do you get around this by just like increasing the mutation rate or something like that? There is, that is one way, to, the one possible way to get around drift is that, and I haven't talked about mutation, is to inter, it, mutation is a source of variation. So as long as you have a lot of variation, you're constantly kind of feeding back a drift. But the downside of mutation is it also gets rid of uh, potentially good individuals. And so, um, so there are other ways that we can deal with this. So we can have large populations. So we find that in natural biological systems, small populations, their entire uh, dis population distributions are pretty much all set by drift. If you have an isolated population of fish um, that's really, really small, and you have a very similar species, but it's been isolated somewhere else, and another one else somewhere else, they will have totally different phenotypes that are selected for, and it's all driven by drift, not by selection. So is drift essentially just getting stuck in a local optimum or something like that? Well, and that's, that's, the, that's the, the vicious thing about it. It's not even a local optima on the fitness objective. Mm -hmm. It might be. We, it's usually close to one, because usually drift only works when the fitness differences are tiny. So, but basically, if your population size gets sufficiently small, the sufficient amount of fitness difference to overpower drift um, is extremely large. So, uh, you just imagine, if you only have two individuals in your population, you're just not gonna ever find the optima, because you know, at generation two, when you go, you go down to each individual, one might reproduce a bunch, the other one will not quite a bunch of it, Bunch. Once you pull them back down to two, there's a good chance you're just going to get stuck with the same genotype, and it may not be the right one. Okay. So, um, so yeah, there's and so there's. If anybody's interested in this, there's something called the drift barrier, and there is a famous biologist who ASU recently poached um, named Mike Lynch, who works in Biodesign Center, and some of his early research was on um, was on these things like the drift barrier and population genetics and figure out how to calculate it, and that is your drift in this. Um, well, I'll take, uh, so I want to let most of you guys go. If you have any other, oh wait, wait, no, I go to 4.20, so we're, 3.05 threw me off. I'm keeping you. Um, so there's another question? Yeah, uh, when you were talking about this, like, in pressure on the drift, how do you really have, like, peak refraction, <coughs> less, will differ, I mean, drift occurs, or? Um, if there's a smaller, uh, so it's like drift and selection are constantly bad at each other. And so when drift is large, which is going to be the case when you have small populations or low variation, then um, the drift is going to win. And you're not, you're, you're not going to climb an optimization objective. You're just going to get more and more like all the previous generations. 